This is the energy at Stanford and Slack program. We started it in 2011. And the goal was to introduce our incoming class of graduate students to all the things that are going on in energy on campus and create relationships and friendships and access points so that the students can fully uh, take advantage of all we have to offer here. Uh, this year we have 129 students, so very impressive. Uh, and little statistics, uh, about half of them are from engineering. Ooh. And uh, and you'll like this too, right? <laughs> the the biggest one is a uh, mechanical engineer. All right. Yeah. Better. But then uh, uh, material cool. science and engineering, and then uh, civil and environmental. Right. So those are Makes the big sense. ones in engineering. Uh, business school, nineteen percent. Yeah. So uh, mm -hmm. so very <laughs> impressive. Uh, uh, I don't know if you've gotten a chance to meet your dean, but anyway, uh, here he is. Um, and then the other 30% are very diverse. Uh, we've got a big contingent from energy resources, engineering, chemistry, applied physics, statistics, music. Um, so really, you know, so it's open to everybody. And, and that's what we, we love about this program is people opting in. And um, so today, joining us, we have uh, three uh, people who play very influential roles in the university. Uh, first, Tom uh, Kenny is a professor of mechanical engineering and also the senior associate dean for student affairs in the School of Engineering. That's on your far left. Uh, and then we have uh, Cam Moeller, and she's the university's vice provost and dean of research. I think this is her, what, third week or second week? Second week. Second yeah. week. <laughs> so we'll ask her a whole bunch of really tough questions and we'll see <laughs> how good she, well she thinks on her feet. Um, she's had numerous leadership positions, uh, most recently as Senior Associate Dean for Natural over, uh, natural Sciences. You're a physicist by training, I, I do believe. Um, and, uh, and she's also chaired the Faculty Senate and served on the University Budget Group and the 2016 uh, Presidential Search Committee. So she really knows the university in, in many more ways than many of us here. Um, and uh, it might be interesting to you, she was also the co-chair of the research subcommittee of the long-range planning process that you heard about from Steve Graham on Monday. So if you have any more questions about that. And then... Uh, questions find... and ideas. We're still taking ideas as well as questions. <laughs> Is there a website that you can still... There's not. There's, there's not. not. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. And then uh, finally, we have John Levin, who's the Dean of the Graduate School of Business here. And he has been a professor of, uh, interestingly, of, of economics and the chair of the economics department. So it's just sort of a test of the unusual views that Stanford has about uh, how people can contribute even beyond sort of their traditional uh, disciplinary background. So uh, again, thanks. So, uh, so, to, so what we'll do is we will... You know, I have a set of questions. We'll try to limit that maybe to half an hour to 40 minutes, and, and then we'll really open it up. So, uh, so do, uh, do think about your questions. Actually, if you have any questions as we're going along, I think that would be the best thing is just to ask away because, again, this is really time for you. Um, so, uh, so just to get started, um, I thought I would ask each of you the same question, and basically it's what's going on in your school or area related to energy or energy security, energy in the environment, energy economics, energy and environment, climate, whatever. So energy broadly defined. And uh, why don't we start right here to my, uh, to my right? Um, so great to see all of you, and I, this is... So I thank you for organizing this fabulous week for the energy interested students. Really glad so we've got so many GSB students. How many, just out of curiosity, how many of you are MBA students? And how many are MSX students? We've got an MSX are awesome. Fantastic. So how about PhD students? Yes. From no, from, 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 from the business school. <laughs> <laughs> No PhD students. Okay, so um, so I would say at the business school we've got a bunch of things. I would say the first thing is we get a significant number of students coming in every year who are interested in energy, and they I think from two directions. One is a set of students who come in who are interested in energy, the energy sector as a career opportunity. And some people come from you know working in the oil fields or working in uh, renewables or. At, and they sort of, so this is an opportunity both to learn business, but also to reach out across the university and see what's going on on the technology frontier and thinking about sustainability and thinking about the 
business models, law, regulation, and so forth. And actually, that's that's one of our great points of contact with some of the the engineering school, the pre core institute, as you're seeing here. It's just that's a and you're a bridge for the rest of our students to get out to the rest of the university in terms of energy connections. So that's one area. The other is we have a, a quite a significant amount of, of energy research that the faculty are doing around business models for energy, around sustainability and things like supply chains, sustainability in cities, in uh, in economic policy, and so forth. We have one faculty initiative, the Energy Business uh, Initiative, which is a joint initiative with the pre core Institute and also with the law school is involved in that as well, run by a fellow named Stefan Reichelstein. Um, and then we have a set of classes about, um, about energy and about sustainability that we offer. Mostly they're MBA elective classes, but they're op those are open to the, anyone at the university. And they're, those are classes on, on business models for energy, about the the um, uh, about we have one about the about power markets and electricity regulation and and competition. Um, we're, we're I hope in the next year we'll introduce a couple of new classes about sustainability. We have a few now. We have a new class that will be offered this year. It's actually not listed yet in Explore courses that'll be on sustainability, uh, as particularly as it relates to climate climate change. Um, That'll be taught by uh, a, w one of the models we use the business school is to pair up academics and practitioners from industry, and that'll be taught by a fellow from the Earth School, David Lobel, and a, and a, and Greg Page, who was the CEO of Cargill, is very interested in climate climate change. Um, and uh, and then I would say we we send a lot of people out into industry, and so we're a great place to find connections to to industry. And we have alumni who are running big energy companies, who are doing renewables, who are running uh, companies all around the world that are that are um, energy sector related companies. And so, this is a good place to come and hear some of those folks speak. Come back to campus and uh, and meet them. So I guess I can answer that with two hats on. First, my last hat is senior associate dean of the natural sciences. How many of you here are? either now in a department or got an undergraduate degree in a department of applied physics, biology, chemistry, math, physics, or statistics? Yes, okay, so quite a lot. So you see the role that natural sciences then has in, in energy research. And I think what characterizes the natural sciences at Stanford is the extent to which our faculty and our students move back and forth between doing foundational research and doing uh, research that has impact on problems and of course, those aren't necessarily different things, um, but I don't think there's very many problems in the world that are, there aren't any problems in the world today that are more important than energy. And in some cases, there's foundational work that's needed. In other cases, the foundational work has already been done and we need people to do the applied work and to get the word out. So that's natural sciences. And then in my new job as Dean of Research, um, I uh, oversee research policy and compliance for the whole university. So that kind of impacts um, everything to some extent. And there, the, the, the goal of the Dean of Research is to facilitate the work that all of you are doing um, in whatever ways it needs to be facilitated by making it possible for your grants to come in on time, to helping you sort out whatever issue it is that you're having with IP or regulations that are preventing your research from going forward. And then the other thing we do in the Dean of Research is we have these wonderful institutes, independent labs and centers and the ones there that are most relevant for energy research, I would say, are SIMES, the Stanford Institute for Materials and Energy Sciences, the Woods Institute, and the Precourt Institute. So how many of you are affiliated with one of those three units? Woods, Precourt, and SIMES. Really? That's surprising. Whoa. Yeah. They all will Oh, be. they're all incoming. <laughs> all right. incoming. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Great. So Woods, Precourt, and Symes, um, all of those have a tremendous amount of wonderful programming that you'll get to know and also have opportunities for getting funding for doing research, um, either through your advisor or through your own work. Okay. So uh, I'm Tom Kenny from the School of Engineering. I'd say... Every department in the School of Engineering has a pretty significant role in energy, either trying to figure out how to produce it, how to store it, maybe how to use it, um, use it wisely maybe, how to manage the use of it, uh, how to dispose of the waste products of energy. 
Um, and the, the cool thing about the School of Engineering, I think in recent years, is that the departments have kind of become accustomed to hiring people from outside their core discipline and, and bringing them into the department as experts that can interact with them, develop interdisciplinary mm -hmm. research, and, and take on projects that are much bigger than a single department's disciplines might suggest. Uh, and, and that's just a cool thing about Stanford. Um, I'm one example of that, my degrees are all in physics. Uh, they hired me in mechanical engineering. Um, on paper, I wasn't technically qualified to be hired. <laughs> so it's, but it's one of these things we do here. We're, we're very open-minded about mixing ideas, mixing backgrounds and expertise. And uh, one thing I think you'll find as you spend your time here at Stanford that uh, you belong to a department, maybe you'll eventually be affiliated with, with a center, but, but you have a hall pass. Uh, you can go to any part of Stanford, talk to any of the 2000 faculty members about ideas, opportunities, their experiences. Um, resources that might help you do things that are exciting. Um, you can merge things from the School of Engineering with Humanities and Science and the Business School, the Law School, the Med School, um, and, and form teams and, and, and take on challenges that, that would require that whole range of, of expertise to make progress. And I, I think Stanford is especially well set up for that. Um, if you're in a PhD program, uh, you can have any advisor from anywhere on campus be your PhD advisor. There's, there's no rule at Stanford that restricts your choice of your PhD advisor. It's just you have to find someone who wants to advise you, of course. It's a mutual thing. Uh, <laughs> but you, if you're in engineering, you could have an advisor in the business school or in humanities and science or in the med school. Um, they could be your principal advisor, and they can guide your research. And it's a little bit your job to establish the networks and, and develop the perspectives that will help you make those choices. Um, so I think one thing that's really important about this event and this week is that you're meeting your future collaborators here in this room. There's people that you'll work with, uh, people you might uh, do PhD research with. Uh, you might end up with groups in research groups with people here that are not your obvious partners. Um, you might start companies with people in the room here. Uh, so make connections this week. Try to build up that Rolodex. Um, 10 years from now, I bet most of you will still have relationships with people you met here this week. And those will be very important relationships for your career and your future. So this is, this is what Stanford is all about. And uh, I wish you all the success that, you, that you'll have. Okay, well, ter terrific. Yeah, so, so that actually introduced this subject. You know, when I talked to lots of prospective students who are considering coming to Stanford or MIT or Caltech or Harvard or Princeton, and, and they always say, well, you know, what's different about, about Stanford? And, and, and I think there are a number of things that are different about it. One, at least for me, was that uh, a real appreciation, as Cam said, for both the foundational science as well as applied problem solving, and that I don't know that anybody does this better in terms of working together with industry or nonprofits or uh, or, or government institutes to uh, to really get ideas out of the university. So that's one thing that I think that is really important, and uh, and also sort of the the very broad perspective that we hope you get. And so what I was hoping that each of you could do is you know thinking about the both two groups of students, one the students in your school, and then the students who are. Uh, not in your school, but who might be interested in some of the things you're interested in. What might be some specific ways, for example, with the, the GSB that, that students who are uh, in School of Engineering or, or in the Natural Sciences, how could they engage with you specifically? Yeah, that's a, so I think one of the ways students can engage at the business schools we, is, is through classes. So we offer a range of classes that are project-based team classes, experiential classes that um, often take, put that, that are often based around entrepreneurship of one sort or another, but they put together teams of students who come from um, different backgrounds. So I'll give you two examples of classes like this. What, one is a, a, a class that we offer called Design for Extreme Affordability. That was one of the original D school classes at Stanford. And um, that's a class where the project, we source the projects in that class. They come from nonprofits and they're typically projects from the developing world where there's a specific problem, which can often be energy related, like build a, 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 
a, a refrigerator that will cost you know less than one hundred and fifty dollars that can be used in the developing world, or that will work even if there's intermittent inter, intermittent power supply. That was one of the projects last year, and the, then the, the teams will coalesce around a project, typically involving a business school student or two, and then engineers or it could be medical or whatever the, the the background is, and they work for for two quarters on a on a uh, on a project to try to come up with a solution with the partner, and they often go off to Bangladesh or Morocco or wherever the project comes from, and and a significant fraction of those projects either get implemented in the world or become companies. Probably last year there were ten projects, and I think at least. Five of them continued over the summer and probably end up launching a lot of social ventures and nonprofits out of that class. We have another class that uh, has a similar in terms of its interdisciplinary teams called Startup Garage. That's a class, again, students come together in teams of four, often uh, interdisciplinary, and the students come with their own, in those classes, come with their own project. So it's a different model. And, um, and lot, we have lots of energy projects in that class, you develop a business plan. If it works, you can go into a second quarter. And that's a class that launches lots and lots of, of companies, often with students from around the, the university and um, companies that you've heard of uh, have come out of that, that class. I can't think off the top of my head of any recent energy. Sunrun maybe came out of that class. But there's a bunch of energy companies uh, come out of, come, have come out of that class. So that's one area. I would say the other area is we have a very <coughs> active energy club that um, mm -hmm. is, there's a GSB energy club, and then there's a university energy club, and they're tightly connected. And so that's another point of intersection, which brings in speakers and does events and so forth. Mm -hmm. And that's a great way to just get engaged. And then the last is through the faculty. And just, you know, particularly for those of your PhD students, you know, coming over to talk to our faculty, you know, you can, we've got a whole set who are interested in energy issues. And like Tom said really well, you know, the barriers at Stanford between the schools are really, really low. That's one of the beauties of being here. You can just, and the physical, but by, by the way, the barriers are, um, that the physical barriers are low. It's about a 10 minute walk over to the business school and the, the intellectual barriers are low. So people are excited to talk to students from other schools. So that's the, that's the third way. Yeah, they were at uh, dinner at the GSB last night. So, there so they've, been, they've walked across that, uh, that divide. We also have excellent food in the cafeteria, so you're always welcome to come for lunch. <laughs> so in natural sciences, we also have classes in the fundamentals of energy technology. And in Dean of Research, there's just a ton of programming that Symes and Woods and Precourt offer, and you're all welcome to come to any of it. And most likely, a lot of times you wouldn't even notice whether the content or activity that's being offered is branded by one of those institutes or by someone in the School of Engineering or the School of Humanities and Sciences or the School of Business. Just take advantage of all the great content that there is here. Um, of course, the research opportunities are wonderful. And then I do want to actually put in a plug for some of the business school and other entrepreneurship programs. I have known a number of students, not only in engineering, but also in natural sciences, who um, even we're doing very foundational, very theoretical, seemingly completely irrelevant PhDs who nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless take advantage of some of the entrepreneurship opportunities and um, therefore went to their academic jobs with a greater understanding of the world outside academia and what, what the end point of some of their research might eventually be, or in some cases decided to start really interesting very socially relevant um, companies as they finish their PhD. So I want to encourage you to, to think about that and to get educated with some of these entrepreneurship programs that we have here. Yes, yeah. those are all great. Actually, maybe before you go on. Yeah. So don't you have something called the Ignite program? Oh, yes. And do you want to we, say a little bit about that? Because I know that that's quite attractive to some students. That's a great point. So we, 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 run, a, we run a program. There's, there's two, this is a program called Ignite that was set up. It's been running for more than 10 years. It's, a, it's basically a mini MBA for PhD students and postdocs and sometimes faculty members from around the university aimed at people who have a technical background. 
but who think that at some point in their careers, whether immediately or later on, they might be interested in trying to, say, commercialize some of the technology they're developing. And that you can, that, you can enroll in that over the summer, and there's also a through-the-year part-time part -time program, and it's, it's called Ignite. We offer it over at the, at the business school. So, And how do you apply? And when do you apply? Or not to put you on the spot? Uh, <laughs> check the website. That's a really good question. Okay. I don't know the answer. <laughs> yeah, see, there's two. There's going. the summer program and then the part-time program. And they have different okay. application dates. The summer one, it'll be sometime in the next, I don't know, six months. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not that that's that helpful. <laughs> so several of my students have taken the Ignite, pro the summer version, and they've really enjoyed it a lot. So thank, thank you, you for bringing. For, yeah, yeah, great, great to bring that up. Yeah. If we have time, I can tell you a vignette later if you want to hear about a concrete example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So those are great examples, and I think the Ignite program and the D School are are maybe sort of hallmarks of what's what is really great about Stanford. And D school, especially, I'm in mechanical engineering, and it sort of grew up out of some faculty in mechanical engineering. We call it the D school. I should say they call it the D school. It's not really a school. Um, doesn't admit students. Doesn't grant degrees. Doesn't really have a budget process that connects to the budget group. Um, they've kind of constructed this magic thing where they have all of the fun parts of being an academic. They get to create <laughs> classes and, and engage with students and do really cool projects. And they've somehow managed to not have any of the onerous administrative things attached to them. Like they don't have to hire any, you know, they don't hire as faculty. They don't deal with promotions. They don't, you know, it's just, it's kind of a miracle. And, you know, I, I think there's a lot of institutions that would be really sort of instinctively opposed to such a thing. Um, it would try really hard to stamp it out or corral it or turn it into a more disciplined and orderly enterprise. And, you know, the D school, it's, it, it's, you should engage with it. It's, it. To the extent it exists, it's not really, there's sort of a place where they hang out, but they don't have a building. Like I say, there's no place where you apply or, or you just show up. Um, they figure out what classes they're going to teach in any particular quarter through a process called pitch night, which is usually three or four weeks before the quarter starts, where they get up and faculty basically pitch their classes to a crowd of students and students vote on whether or not they think that should happen or not. And at the end of the night, they say, okay, I guess we're going to do this and we're not going to do that. And then three weeks later, those courses happen. Um, departments have curriculum committees and, you know, procedures and schedules. This stuff takes maybe more than a year to launch a class. So, um, not in applied physics. Kind of light touch with the curriculum. Oh, all right, all right, all right. Uh, I've, I've engaged with some of the faculty in applied physics. I know change is a little hard sometimes. Um, but, you know, so, but, and these are just examples. Uh, you know, what, what goes on in Stanford, there'll be a thing like the D school that's created while you're here. Um, I don't know who's going to do it or what it's called or what they'll do, but it'll be some crazy thing and they'll go out and raise some money and they'll start doing stuff and then they'll come and see the dean of research and ask if it's okay. Um, Cam will have to decide whether or not to shut them down or not. But um, at, at Stanford, they we, probably we, won't ask me. They'll they, probably just do it. They probably won't ask you until someone yeah. sort of rejects a reimbursement request of some kind or some <laughs> sort of thing gets in their way. Um, so, I, you know, I really encourage you to explore all of these things. The, the classes, particularly these interdisciplinary project classes, they're, they're great opportunities to meet uh, people that are outside your department, outside of your sort of normal path across campus. Um, and, and sort of build relationships and, and see bigger problems than you might see in a disciplinarily focused enterprise. Um, it's, you're in a great place. I, I've been here 25 odd years and every day I'm surprised about something that's going on here that I think would be hard to do at another place. So, so maybe could you say something about prerequisites for these classes that tend to attract people from across campus? Are there a lot of prerequisites or and so do you have to be very deliberate about planning your time here or are they sort of come one, come all? And The classes I just mentioned are at, you have to apply for those classes. So mm -hmm. there's an application process. Mm -hmm. You have to be selected into them. Yeah. Um, and the sort of balance between demand and supply varies from year to year. So that's, mm -hmm. uh, and depends on exactly the nature of the projects and, and so forth. Um, but, but there, anyone can apply. So they're open in that sense to, to everyone. Okay. All right. Yeah, I could just add to that too. Yeah. So a lot of the, a lot of the structures around these kinds of programs teach little pop up classes or kind of just in time information capture events for you. So and, and this maybe reflects the, the world that you're all growing up in where 
if you need to learn something, you can go learn it. You know, there's a million ways through the internet to get access to some bit of content that you need at the moment. You can pack it in, go do a project, and and then move on and do something else. So I I think if I think about like prerequisites for a course like uh, Design for Extreme Affordability, I don't think there are any prerequisites for that class. You have to apply, and you get right. selected by a group of people that are trying to form teams that can address their problems. But it's not like you have to have taken three computer science classes and seven math classes or something. There's just nothing like that that's explicit. I'll just give you, just to give you an example of how that class works. The, the, I mentioned that the project on the refrigerator. So that project had a mechanical engineer on it. It had a business school student. And the person who turned out to play a key role in that project is, was actually one of Stanford's groundskeepers who who was uh, who they the students had met during the sort of an initial project when they were just going around and and I think they were trying to figure out a little Im- tweak improvement in one of the groundskeeping processes and one of the people in Stanford's facilities crews he's just an amazing handyman and it turned out that he was the one who solved like all of the key technical problems <laughs> in this project <laughs> that's fun um, okay, so uh, so we kind of talked about what's here now, and and uh, and I'd like now to look to the future. And you know, as as you know, we have a, a new uh, a new president and a new provost, and, and and actually in many ways a very you know new leadership team here at the university. And I was wondering if you could look forward and say some of the things that you're most excited about that that might changes that may be coming or areas where, where you think that there'll be a lot more attention uh, focused on and, and then perhaps their intersection with energy, environment, security, and so forth. So I think the long range planning process has been, uh, it's been a bit of a long process here at Stanford. And uh, what's happening this year is that the president has identified, the president and the executive cabinet have identified a number of topics as being important topics. And this is now the the year of the design team. So there will be design teams who are looking at sustainability, um, design teams who are looking at the natural world, um, broadly defined. And so both of those design teams, I'm sure, will be considering energy as a major part of the research portfolio that Mm -hmm. we want to accelerate through whatever it is that we do at the end of the long range planning. So I think that'll be quite important. Um, Another thing that's happening is that there will also be some look at flexible funding. Um, How can the university, the university's Mm -hmm. efforts obviously can't replace external funding um, and will never come close to replacing government funding or funding from private individuals and foundations. But there are places where we can look for gaps. We can help to identify those gaps. We can help to get people who are working in that gap, the seed funding that they need, and in, in, in rare cases, perhaps more than seed funding. So that's something that'll also come out of the long range planning. Yeah, maybe could you say a little bit about, I might be using the wrong words, uh-huh. transla- translational social science? Right, absolutely, yeah. yes. And then maybe a little bit about AI and, and uh, yeah, machine learning, you know, all, all that stuff. That's sure, happening. so those are also research initiatives that could be uh, relevant to energy. So uh, translational social science, or I think um, accelerating applications, social problem solving is what it's being called in the new, um, in the new design teams. So I think that's a very exciting mm-hmm. opportunity for making progress on energy. Um, I, I think it's very frustrating to work on things that are technological solutions to a problem that seems like a technologically perhaps solvable problem and to realize the extent to which the major gaps are, are social gaps. Um, and then of course, of course, AI and data science have huge roles to play in, in all aspects of intellectual and social progress over the next decade. And there'll be a research initiative on the digital future, which includes components of both of those. Mm-hmm. I'll mention one thing. So as you already heard about, the, we had this long-range planning process. And I would say one of the, one of the, one, part of that process was just to identify you know, what, were the, what were the big opportunities in the world, some of which have come about because of changes in technology, like the availability of data everywhere that's enabling 
technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning and data science and so forth. Some of them are things like the energy transformation that's going on. Some are, some are social, the biomedical revolution, other technical, logical change that's enabling a lot of innovation in the life sciences. Some were social changes like the the, the decline in, in economic mobility in the, in the United States, the, the, the changes in globalization and so forth. And thinking about, you know, what is the role of Stanford in, in coming to terms and doing something positive about these big issues in the world? And, and I would say that the, one of the, there were, there were two themes that to me were very resonant during this process. One was the idea that universities need to go from the most basic fundamental discovery, which as Sally said, all the way to applied translation and application, entrepreneurship, commercialization of technologies. And, and, that, and or in the case of say, the social sciences, just getting ideas and solutions out into policy, out into to, to, to the general discussion. And how can Stanford better do that, 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 that all the way from the most fundamental discovery, like banging particles into each other at Slack, all the way up to you know the most applied. And of course, in the business school, we're we're mostly at the applied end, although we do have faculty doing more discovery-based research. And then, secondly, that to address lots of problems in the world, energy any energy issue is falls in this category. You want to have people who span the whole range from science to the social sciences, and often to humanities. For there's ethical issues or thinking about effects on humans or humanity and lawyers. And Stanford is very, very effective at bringing together people from different disciplines. That's one of the real um, hallmarks of the university. And so I, almost everything that came out of the Long Range Plan is sort of predicated on, let's try to bring together people from all around the university to work on problems. And let's try to think about problems from the very fundamentals all the way to, to the most applied. And, and I think all the you know, energy issues that that were discussed it was an initiative around sustainability that Steve Graham probably talked about falls in this category, you know, sort of have those uh, features. Yeah, to me, it feels a bit like Stanford is kind of organizing itself to be a much bigger leader in the world right now than it's been over the last 15 or 20 years. Um, you know, we went through the economic downturn and, and there were various threats to the health of higher education. At Stanford, I think, you know, turned inward a little bit, focused on generating resources and, and, and taking care of business inside. Uh, the last president, the last provost, I think were really good at that. And, and we survived what was a pretty, pretty rough time in the external world for higher education. Um, lots of other institutions were cutting back and killing off things that were valuable. Stanford really sustained a lot of things that were really important. Um, built up our endowment and, and sort of and built, like the buildings you're in here, this, this squad is, you know, roughly a billion dollars worth of infrastructure that went up starting 2008, right at the worst part of the economy. So, so the institution, I think, spent the last decade kind of making sure it was going to be strong and healthy. And, and, and now, I, I, at least what I hear from leadership is that if, if you look outside of Stanford, there's a little bit of a shortage of external thoughtful leadership on important topics. Um, and, and it's maybe becoming more important for Stanford to make some statements about what's important and, and where problems that are that need to be solved should get started and, and what kind of resources can be brought to that. And, and maybe unique among academic institutions, or maybe just a very few exceptions, we have the resources to go and do some big, bold, risky things that, that other institutions just couldn't afford to start. Um, we're not as dependent on you know, quarterly budget processes in DC as a lot of other institutions, we can afford to get out a little bit and, and say some things that might seem a bit risky and, and, and stake out a leadership position in certain areas. Things like energy, the climate, the planet, health, the economy, uh, diversity, topics that, that maybe the positions we take are going to be a little bit at, con, you know, at sort of contrast with some of the positions that are being taken in leadership in Washington right now. Um, so I think, you know, with our leadership and this long range planning process and, and a lot of, of kind of reorganization within the institution, it sort of feels like Stanford is getting ready to jump out and do some big, bold things. And I don't know exactly what all those are going to be. We, you know, long range planning is producing some catchphrases and, and, and titles that I think are giving us clues as to what those might be. But the, the leadership and, and people involved all the way from faculty down to students are are going to be defining exactly what those are. And I, I'd encourage you to, to be involved in that. Um, 
when there are calls for ideas for engagement, you, you have a chance to jump in and, and be part of those conversations and talk about what the future, what parts of the future are important for you. Uh, Stanford, the resources that are here, including the on-campus and the surrounding communities, the venture capital community, um, other things like that, we, we have access to enormous resources to, to do important things and do them well. And, and you get to be part of that. I just want to make a quick comment about boldness and risk in the context of the fact that we are a nonprofit organization whose mission is to do research and education. And I think it is a real, <clears throat> a real hallmark of Stanford that we have this ecosystem where foundational new understanding and things that have impact flourish side by side. Um, and part of that impact is that we do have to be very aware of this boundary, that we are an institution that does research and education. We're not an advocacy organization, right? We're not allowed to be uh, advocates for most political positions that are not directly relevant to our research and education mission. Um, and I think that's entirely appropriate. We need to be a place where ideas can flourish. Um, and we are also not a company. And so as, you know, my guess is that since you're here in this room, you're probably interested in having an impact. And it, whether your interests take you towards advocacy or take you towards uh, companies, if you have questions about what's allowed, questions about IP, questions about it, am I talking about a research result or am I crossing the line into advocacy, we have an awesome research policy handbook. Um, so you can read it. And, and, wow. and, and uh, if you and I, I'm, I'm just it's my second week in the job, so I'm not sure if there's a email at the bottom to send notes to in case something's not clear. If something's not clear in the research policy handbook, you can email me. Kmuller at Stanford.edu. I'd rather hear about it before it happens. Oh. Yeah. And and our goal is to try to facilitate your work. So uh, so thinking about this group here, I'm guessing that there's a certain fraction of them that may eventually be interested in having academic jobs and, and so forth. And I was wondering if you could just say a little bit about, you know, looking over the past couple of years and maybe forecasting out over the next year or so, what are some of those areas where we're looking for new faculty and, you know, what are sort of the hot topics or areas where you know, we, uh, you know, the existing faculty are leaving and we need to replace them. You know, what, what are those exciting opportunities? And, and then maybe how might they interact with, with energy as well? But, but just broadly thinking about from a disciplinary perspective for a minute. So, so the School of Engineering had an internal long range planning process a couple of years ago called SOE Future. And it produced a set of 10 thrust areas that we think are important for the school to pay attention to. They're, they're all interdisciplinary. They cover things like energy, health, the planet, um, how to make materials, you know, from the atomic scale and up. I, I, to the extent that that's being used to guide faculty hiring and, and, and new directions in the school, it's, it's guiding us towards being more interdisciplinary, uh, thinking less about um, preserving the legacy of the thing that got a certain department to be number one in its field and, and thinking more about what, what are the future opportunities and exciting activities for, for those disciplines. Um, we've been, a lot of our searches for faculty recently have been in this category of very broad searches. So, so instead of, you know, a replacement search for the professor of, you know, making uh, left footed shoes or something, a really narrow thing that was excellent and, you know, very important, we don't necessarily want to replace exactly that left footed shoe. Um, so we've had searches in things like robotics, which could touch seven or eight departments in the School of Engineering. And a committee of faculty from all those departments comes together and, and candidates from all those disciplines apply. And, and we hired multiple candidates out of those kinds of searches. So I, I think this is a trend that, that we've had a lot of success with. You, when you have these broad searches, you get much bigger applicant pools. You have a much bigger sense of what the opportunities might be. And, and it's a little easier to, to hire uh, riskier candidates instead of recognizing that someone needs to make left-footed shoes and we better find the best person at that. Uh, if we're going to hire six people in robotics, we can hire six really interesting, uh, you know, people that are going to do brand new things. And, and it's been exciting. I, so that's the trend I've seen is, you know, get away from the narrow kind of topical replacements and, and think more broadly about things that cross disciplines and, and can impact bigger problems. I would say for those of you who are PhD students and are start to, I mean, as you get a little farther and you start to think about your dissertation topics, I mean, I, I, my my advice, my you know, which you should 
you should value what you're paying for it is um, you know not don't not to be too strategic about what's a what's a what will get you a job. The the thing that you see with you if you look at Stanford faculty is people's careers evolve a tremendous amount. People can move in all different directions over the course of their career. When we hire people at the business school, we hire people into different groups from different disciplines. We almost never, and in fact, we we should never, although it has occasionally happened, try to hire people just to say, because we need someone to teach a particular course or to fill a particular thing. We sh- You always want to hire people just who's who's just super excited who's doing amazing interesting research and is energetic and is ambitious they're going to go in some direction you don't even know what it's going to be when you hire them and that's going to be fabulous and then if it turns out that like a big area opens up if you had hired if you hired people who are ambitious and excited and and bright they'll go there in fact they'll go there before you even figured out it was a big area so that that's always our theory in hiring is you just you just try to pick people who are going to be fabulous and then sort of, you know, let them loose basically. And I, and, and I think that, I think broadly that's worked out really, really, really well at Stanford. That's, that's a, that's a great, great, great strategy. I think that was really well said. I think um, you're here to get an advanced degree and the best way to prepare yourself for academic work is to really just make the most of your advanced degree. Yeah. People are looking for bold and deep thinkers, and the best way to look like a bold and deep thinker is to be a bold and deep thinker. So, (laughs) (laughs) okay, all right. So, I'm I'm going to ask you one more question, and these could be brief answers, and then we'll open it up to everybody here. Um, So, put yourself back in the mindset of where you were the week before your graduate studies started. (laughs) <laughs> that's who we've got it here and and think about you know with all you've learned what would be some advice that uh, that you would give this group of people that uh, might be helpful and uh, we can whoever wants to go first wow <laughs> it really matters who you work with trust your gut <laughs> I, I think that's that's right. I mean, you, you're going to make decisions and judgments your whole life about what to do, what not to do. You're going to have you're going to have tons of options always. So you need to start practicing the process of making decisions and trusting your instincts is a big part of that. But first, you have to you have to develop them, and you develop them by looking at choices and 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 thinking about what you want to do and 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 going forward and then seeing what happens. So yeah, develop that instinct and, and then trust it about what's right for you. It's not to say that it's that opportunity is not a good opportunity. It'll be great for someone else. What's the best opportunity for you? I, I think the piece of advice I wish I had in going to graduate school was, uh, going to, and I did a PhD, was um, it's, it can be really, really hard. And I, I, yeah. I, it's, writing a PhD thesis is just tough. It's real, I mean, at least for me, it was hard to find a dissertation topic. I struggled to do that. I felt super depressed for part of graduate school, even though everyone thought I was like doing great because it, but it, it just, it was hard. And, and what I realized later as I went on my career was, um, first of all, that feeling didn't go away. I always sort of felt anxious about, was I doing enough <laughs> in every different dimensions? And, and it took me a while to realize that everyone else felt exactly the same way. And I, uh, I, I kind of wish I'd known that at the start when it looked like everyone else was sort of killing it, and I was, uh, uh, you know, maybe not killing it quite at the same level that, that some of my peer, peers were. Um, so uh, even if they told me, I probably wouldn't have believed it. But I kind of wish they told me at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I'll just o- <laughs> offer one thing. Um, when I was an undergraduate, I was a fine student. You know, mm-hmm. good enough. Um, but when I went to graduate school, I think the real difference for me was I cultivated a love for learning and I really, I did more. I did, I wanted to understand more than was being offered to me and, and I really worked hard, but I just loved it. And, and that has stuck with me my whole life. So that love of learning. So when you're going through those rough patches, which there'll be plenty, just, you know, if you just say, I, I'm learning. This is fantastic. Okay, so now we're going to open it up to everyone, and uh, this is your chance to ask questions. And yeah, so please. Thank you so much for this uh, panel.
my question is about uh, video resources. So there was a lot of talk about how to think about your video and things you can do at Stanford. Uh, what are some of the resources that students rely on in each of your schools you know, which plan not only their career here but also beyond? So there's, <clears throat> there's a career counseling center whose acronym is BEAM, um, bonus award for anyone who knows what the acronym stands for, <laughs> um, something, something meaningful. Um, and uh, <laughs> so it's, called, it's called BEAM. Um, and there's also, there's, <laughs> there's a vice provost for graduate education who has a lot of really terrific programming. Mm -hmm. um, so I would look at the VPGE website and uh, there's just, there's great programming there. Um, thesis boot camp is something that's been helpful mm -hmm. to a lot of students. Yeah. Yes, uh, over there. Yeah, maybe just to add to that. So the School of Engineering has a, has a, a group called the Technical Communication Program. They're really good at, at helping you write resumes and prepare for interviews, uh, write manuscripts, thesis drafts, things like that. It's very hands-on, one-on-one sort of peer writing, coaching. Um, and then the other group, the other thing I'd mention is there's these, there's a huge number of student organizations at Stanford. I think there's 700 of them. Um, there's the CS for Social Good organization. There's the Solar Car Team. Um, these organizations have networks of alumni that have gone out and gotten jobs, and, and they really engage closely with them. In some ways, it's a lot more tangible and useful than our alumni associations or other organizations. So uh, if you get sort of, if you find a student organization that's doing things you're excited about, that might be a really useful channel towards career opportunities and pathways. Uh, thank you so much for the engaging discussion and your advice and suggestions. My question goes to Jonathan. So you mentioned about a couple of uh, programs that the GSP offers, like the Startup Garage. And so how does the intellectual property work? Does that get associated with Stanford? Could you talk a bit about that? And also, yeah. like, uh, once you complete your degree, is there, are there any incubator programs uh, that GSP or any other like programs where you can sort of start working on your idea and take it forward or and get some funding and so on from Stanford. So. Yeah. Um, okay, so two, two questions. One was about intellectual property. One was about sort of at post-graduation, how can you continue to work on, on, on projects? Um, intellectual property. I would say the, the classes that I've been talking about, most of them uh, don't involve intellectual property that would be you know that where where as part of the class you would develop a, a something that was patentable and if you did it would fall under Stanford's pat general policy about uh, intellectual property development which is you file through the office of technology licensing and 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 then there's rules about exactly how uh, the rights and and revenue streams and so forth are are allocated but most of the projects don't don't have that level of, they might draw on some, someone else's intellectual property been developed in a lab around campus, but it wouldn't, as part of the project, you wouldn't, in general, I can't think of any that have developed uh, IP. Um, second question about afterward. So, um, so the, the design for extreme affordability actually has a summer extension that people stay over the summer and work in the, there's a, we have a lab at the business where people continue in that class. We don't have an incubator at the business school. Um, we have about probably about 40 companies that start every year out of the business school, um, but they, we, we don't have our own incubator. Stanford has an incubator called StartX, which mm -hmm. students can apply to, to be part of. Mm -hmm. That's a university-wide. And then, I mean, just the general ecosystem in Silicon Valley is that if you have a good idea, you'll you're likely to be able to find funding in space for it so that we've never felt there was a shortage of venture capitalists within a three mile <laughs> radius that we needed to get into the venture capital <laughs> business um, but I uh, um, uh, but but this the, the social ventures piece is a is a, an exception that's why with the design for extreme affordability we support people after after graduation. Okay, more questions. Uh, yeah. I have a question for uh, Dean Kenny about um, SOE future. You mentioned um, the faculty determine maybe roughly 10 uh, thrust areas. Mm -hmm. um, can you um, um, give some insight on any uh, which ones uh, are relevant for um, energy in the School of Engineering? I, so I'm, I'm not 
going to attempt to recite the 10 questions. I've mostly forgotten them, but so what I remember of them, <laughs> there, there was one that was about energy, sort of energy for all applications. Uh, there's, um, there were 10, among the 10 questions, there was uh, questions relating to sustainable cities, which energy is a huge factor in. There, were, there was one that had to do with um, the earth and the health of the earth. And, and they're, of course, extracting, using, and, and discarding the resource, the, the residual use of energy is, is at the core of the health of the planet. Um, and I, I, so those 10 questions aren't, aren't being used specifically to do any, you know, highly focused, you know, top-down kind of thing. Stanford doesn't do top-down very often. Uh, so it's, it's more that we've agreed that we have a lot of faculty that are interested in these topics, that we think there's resources that we can get our hands on to go after them, and that uh, we'll be looking to attract students and faculty in the areas that are around those questions and, and try to push them forward. So um, I guess I'm not giving you a good answer to your question that's you know, immediately actionable, but there's, there's going to be great things around those topics that I'm sure you'll have a chance to engage with. So is that report on the web? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think you can, on the School of Engineering, up, you can find your... Yeah, SOE Future, I think, and a few keystrokes on Google, and you'll all find it pretty quickly. Okay. More, more questions. So we've got one up here. Um, do you have any examples of successful um, companies, startups that have come out of StartX recently? Of StartX. I, I actually I don't I don't know because I haven't been that involved with Stardex. Um, I do hmm. have a, so I, you know I'm just thinking of Stardex companies. People I know. I mean, I, so there's a former student of mine that started a gene splicing company, and they went to Stardex. It was basically two former PhD students and a friend of theirs who was their kind of CFO starter person, you know, kind of amateur CFO, and they they did the Stardex program. Um, and everyone else, them and everyone else I've talked to that have been through it said it was enormously helpful at getting them to think carefully and properly about the important issues that investors are going to ask them. You know, if you're a technologist or you're just not experienced, you, you, the questions they're going to ask are not questions you would think of. And, and they're really judging you on your answers to those questions right at the start. You know, what is your plan? What is your market? How are you going to get to revenue? What's the margin? Who's going to make the thing? You know, what are the risks around that? Is it onshore, offshore? You know, there's, so Stardex is really good at taking a small team through kind of a tactical boot camp and, and getting them ready to stand up in front of investors and make those pitches. Um, and, and so this team and others I know, they come out of it and they, they tell everyone, it's like, if you're going to start a company, you know, go do that first. You know, if, and you'll find out through that process whether you should start it and, and how to go about doing it. Um, and then the comment about venture capitalists, I mean, you're, you couldn't be in a better position to have access to the venture capital community than right here. I mean, it's literally a 10 minute bike ride to the top 10 venture firms that each spend a few billion dollars a year on startups. Um, I, I know a lot of VCs, I'll, I'll say they're, uh, they have a great job. Um, they don't work Fridays, they don't work August or December or much of January. Um, <laughs> they don't tend to work in the evenings. They travel some, but they actually prefer to stay home. And, and so they love to spend their money on startup companies that are here because they like to go to board meetings that they can drive to or you can ride their bike to. So and because of that, that resource, there's this huge infusion of capital into the local economy that is just an advantage for people trying to start companies here. They're going to spend $10 billion in the next year on startups here in Silicon Valley. They don't know what they're going to spend it on. They're still figuring it out. But you can almost, you can almost guarantee that that much money is going to go into ideas right around the, the Bay Area. And you're in the best place to, to find those people and pitch your ideas to them. Two useful resources on campus that are sort of accessible to students are at the Business School, the Center for Entrepreneurial Studies, which sponsors, I think we've got, if, last year we had 58 entrepreneurship classes that we offered. Center for, and then the Stanford Technology Venture Partners, which is in the School of Engineering, mm -hmm. which also runs a whole lot of entrepreneurship classes. And both of those centers have a sort of just a constant, they, they have space for projects and they also just have a constant flow of people coming in from entrepreneurs and venture capitalists and you know, different sort of interesting people. And so that, those, are, those are both terrific resources. 
So I'm going to do a quick poll just uh, just for interest. So um, so you'll get a choice: entrepreneurship, uh, you know, academic career, uh, policy, government, uh, and then maybe corporate. Okay. So what at this moment in time? Which of those sort of do you imagine? And not to say that that's what will happen, but what do you imagine? So how many of you are interested in entrepreneurial uh, kind of careers? Okay, a lot of you. Okay. All right, how many uh, imagine you might be in academic? Oh, a lot of you as well. Okay, how many are interested in policy, government, think tank kind of stuff? Yeah, okay, not so many of you. We need to do a better job recruiting uh, <laughs> students in, in that area. And, uh, and gosh, what was the last one? Corporate, yeah, corporate. Who's interested in that? Okay. All right, so academic and entrepreneurial uh, seem to be the dominant. Anyway, so why don't, do we have a final question? Actually, can I put in a final plug for yep. the Office of Technology Licensing because IP has come up a couple times. We have uh, our Office of Technology Licensing is a model for all of our peer institutions. Yep. If, you want, if you're not familiar with the process of patenting something and you want to know, is this an idea? Is this IP? Should I be protecting this? Um, just they have a super easy web interface They'll be happy to talk to you. They're on your side. Yeah, OTL. Yeah, I would add to that. I mean, it's a tremendous resource. If you have an idea and you want to file for a patent and you want to do it yourself, I mean, I would say that's a bad idea. It costs a lot of money. You don't know what you're doing. It's probably, and you can't defend it. I mean, if someone thinks you have a great idea and they decide to infringe your patent, you have to sue them. You need to hire lawyers and, and spend a lot of money before you might win that outcome. Stanford vigorously... Uh, prosecutes and defends its patents. We get great attorneys to write great IP. And if anyone comes after your idea and tries to use it without getting a license, Stanford will attack them. And Stanford wins. I mean, the world knows. Don't mess with Stanford IP. You know, license it. Deal with it properly. And we you also, want that on your side. Yeah. Well, we also we won't just defend it. We'll also vigorously shop it yeah, if, if right. we think it's shoppable. Yeah. So OTL is here to help you. Yeah. Just yeah. one related question. Now we're coming to OTL. You know. So if you file at Stanford, Stanford covers all those costs. Um, if if eventually it's licensed out, they'll they'll retain some of the costs as part of the first payouts from the license, and then after that, a third goes to the investors. I'm sorry, a third goes to the inventors. A third goes to the departments, and Stanford keeps a third of the of the revenue after that from licensing. Um, and if there's any follow-on patents, the Stanford will work with you on, on how to take care of those properly. It's this not a big profit maker for the university, actually. It's yeah. it's more about making sure that the ideas get the protection impact that they deserve. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can I put in one quick plug for policy, just for my economics background, <laughs> which is it, it, even if you're not interested in policy per se. Energy is a hugely regulated sector. And if you get the opportunity at some point at Stanford to take a class in policy, there's great energy policy classes in the economics department. We have a few in the business school, law school. And management science and engineering has a bunch of people who do a lot of energy policy. There's people who do climate policies in the earth school. It, it's, you know, the, the government can do things that no company can do. And this was, I, this was brought home to me last week. I was in Beijing. They had the Africa summit in Beijing last week. And when I showed up in Beijing, the sky looked like this, like Silicon Valley. I'd never seen that. It looked like that for three days. Then the government let the factories go back on. <laughs> and you could barely see, you know, from the hotel to the building, you know, a quarter mile away. <laughs> it just reminds you the <laughs> government is... There's nothing like, you know, the state has control that is, in, yeah. in a way, in China is, of course, a special case, but, but, <laughs> but um, mm -hmm. it, it really is a powerful force. And so understanding that's really important, even if you, even if you want to, you know, be a Silicon Valley entrepreneur. So just putting a small plug while the opportunity at Stanford to learn about that. Okay. Well, I think we'll let that be the last <laughs> word. So uh, anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.